All right, so welcome to the last session that we have for this year, History of Medicine. So we've uh, awkwardly divided this topic into six different talks, and we are at the last one, which is basically a retrospective looking at some of the things that, um, in hindsight, we now know to have been problematic in the process of medical history and looking backwards at the different cultures that were involved, the different aspects of um, power relationships that were involved, things that have set medical history back apart from the scientific aspects that uh, are sometimes hilariously backward from our contemporary ending. All right, so in the chat, just let me know if you guys can see the presentation, missed opportunities. And I will get rolling if I get some affirmatives. Very good, okay. So first and foremost, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to Christine Carroll. Uh, she was in the class of 2015 and this in session was actually her idea. She wanted me to uh, explore the history of women in medicine. And not only was that a fantastic idea, but it was also a good idea to look at groups that had been deliberately excluded from the process of studying medicine in the Western tradition and the upsides, the downsides and so forth. So let's jump way back in history and talk about ancient history and the role of women in those cultures. Now, in ancient Egypt, there were, and like other civilizations, there were goddesses that were associated with disease and healing. Isis was preeminent amongst the ancient Egyptians, and she had women healers associated with her in their temples, and they were all women. Asclepius, as we mentioned in the first talk, was the Greek god of healing, but he had several mythological children, including daughters like uh, Panacea and uh, Hygienia, who were involved in looking at different aspects of health. So Hygieia and Panacea being preeminent there. So there were women who were, or at least uh, deities, who were personified as women that were involved in human health. Now, in terms of actual people we know existed, the first named woman in Western history, let alone physician, but a named woman in Western history is Merit Ta from around 250, sorry, 2500 BC or BCE. So she is on record as a not only women physician, but someone who was the chief of physicians, likely overseeing the other uh, doctors and healers that were associated with the pharaoh in that era. There's a medical papyrus, the Cahoon, that uh, is associated with her teachings and gave detailed instructions on female diseases, female anatomy, and also surgery involving women, which uh, likely involves midwifery, the ability of uh, women physicians to bring children uh, fruitfully into the world. And she's roughly contemporary with Imhotep, who we mentioned already as a precursor for Asclepius in Greece. So Merit Ta is one of the first people we have any record of having existence regarding uh, healing, let alone being the first woman who is named in that regard. Now jumping back, to, or not jumping forward rather, to Greece, we have Agnodici from 300 BC, who was actually a woman who pretended to be male so that she could actually get trained as a doctor. She studied with Herophilus at Alexandria and practiced until she was actually denounced by a rival and sentenced to death for practicing medicine as a woman. Now, ancient Greece and later Rome were very restrictive societies for women. They were expected to stay indoors, away from social interactions that weren't strictly regulated by male relatives. So having a woman involved in business and healing was something that was very much outside the bounds for ancient Greece. She was actually sentenced to die for practicing medicine as a woman, but women patients actually protested and demonstrated publicly to prevent her sentence from being carried out. So the fact that those women were the wives and daughters of many powerful people in Athens at the time made quite the impression. Now, as we look at ancient history, Egypt, Greece, Rome, etc., they really were not societies where women were treated with any degree of equality, but there were a role, there was a role rather for women in medical healing, especially related to midwifery and the healing of women's uh, diseases that were specific to women. And these were based around goddesses or at least temples that were devoted to that topic. Now, when monotheistic religions 
came into that area, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, not only were, you know, women physicians and women deities taken out, all other deities other than Yahweh, Allah, etc., were removed from consideration. So the fact that the monotheistic religions came in meant that there was no role for these female deities and no role for the priestesses who might have been acting as healers at the time. So women continued after the fall of Rome and uh, after the ancient period as midwives and nursemaids and really did have a role assisting other women in health-related issues, even if they weren't official. Now, moving into the Middle Ages, we're making a big jump, around 500 years, but the next name that we have to offer was Hildegard von Bingen. And she was actually a nun, and I believe she became the mother uh, superior of her order, or at least of her convent. And not only was she someone who wrote about medicine, she was also considered to be a Christian mystic who had many different visions. Uh, some people actually argue that her visions were actually due to a migraine aura that she suffered that gave her mystical visions, but were, you know, what we would consider now to be part of a um, aura visually that manifested before she would have a migraine headache. But she was very involved in women's health and medicine. She worked on various disease descriptions, worked on medicinal plants. Uh, she actually is someone who described how blood sugar and urine and diabetes were all connected. Not that diabetes was isolated to the pancreas and insulin, but she could figure out that there was a connection there. And like many people at the time operating under the humoral idea, felt that there was an kind of connection between disease states and the disruption of the body's equilibrium. So she also kind of prefigured the idea of contagion, of disease spreading from person to person. So she's also known to have worked on women's specific issues like the female reproductive system, but also looked at how puberty and uh, development occurred as people aged, birth defects, and how physical illness could be connected to different mental states. Now, if we take a good look at this uh, reproduction of Hildegard von Bingen, I'm really struck with the idea that, and I really hope this is true, that uh, in fact, Maggie Smith is an immortal who just has been with us for thousands upon thousands of years and is just contemporarily now uh, pretending to be herself, but was actually Hildegard von Bingen in the past. Now, if that's not your brand of humor, I hope this one is. I discovered on YouTube a while ago, there's a uh, new musical genre called Bardcore, where they take uh, pop music and turn it into medieval basic things. So here's the uh, Lady Gaga Bad Romance medieval style cover. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that the uh, channel is named Hildegard von Blingen. So enjoy that. And feel free to check it out. It's hilarious. So in the medieval era, what sort of roadblocks existed to prevent women from acting as physicians? Well, several. Uh, women were relegated to a lower social status, although interestingly, not as low as they had been in the ancient era. We often think of the medieval ages as being the worst of the worst, but in fact, women had more freedom and more agency in many cases in the medieval and Renaissance eras than they did in ancient times. So women who were uh, kind of lay healers, wise women or old wives would act as healers and largely work through superstition, but occasional knowledge of pharmacy. But the pharmacy would be very much based around simple plant preparations that could be very variable depending on exactly how potent the leaves, the flowers, the herbs that they were working with. Now, being the Middle Ages, if these treatments didn't work or these women became uh, prosperous, they could be accused of witchcraft and that could lead to their downfall. And approximately 50 to 100,000 women had been killed during the medieval era for practicing medicine and being accused of witchcraft. In fact, there's a uh, one I thought that was interesting. In uh, 1322, a woman named Jacoba Felice was charged by uh, the Faculty of Medicine in Paris for practicing medicine and basically acting as a physician. And it was enough for her to have been accused of practicing medicine to be brought up on charges. So by the mid 14th century, by the 1300s, the medical profession had not only campaigned to put itself up in high status, it was very much a patriarchal activity and male physicians held a distinct monopoly on the practice of any kind of medicine 
or apothecary or surgery at the time. Now, women could eke a living out as healers if they were working with the lower classes. They weren't making much noise. They weren't making much money. But any kind of visibility would cause them to lose their practice and possibly be executed. In fact, uh, there's an interesting anecdote here in uh, 1588. Queen Elizabeth I was actually petitioned to overrule the finding of some uh, of the College of Physicians against a woman healer named Margaret Kennix. Now, she had been practicing for a while and was actually fairly well thought of. Now, the quote here is going to be from the uh, trial. And essentially what it's saying is that her secretary of state, a guy named Francis Walsingham, an incredibly interesting person in his own right, uh, presented the case to the queen, basically petitioning that Margaret Kennex should be allowed to continue working as a healer for the poor because she was actually very effective. But the physician's college very much thought that that was, you know, even though that was something she should be commended for trying to be good to other people, that it would set a terrible precedent. And even though she was trying to support her family through medical practice, the precedent alone was bad enough that they would not allow her to work. And Queen Elizabeth I did not exactly, um, did not in fact um, overturn that finding by the College of Physicians. So as we move from the medieval era into the Renaissance era and into the early modern era, there were many types of healers, both male and female, for people to utilize. We had apothecaries who prepared and sold the medicines that were going to be drawn from simples, plants and herbs, or even compounds that were brought together by multiple things. We had midwives who were going to be involved in helping bring children into the world. Bone setters, something we haven't talked much about, although they're pretty fascinating in their own right. People who were distinct from barbers and barber surgeons who would set dislocated bones and take care of closed fractures. Surgeons, as we've already discussed, were involved with both amputations and bloodletting at this early era. And then physicians were the people who we would consider to be doing things that we associate with internal medicine these days. Uh, one second. Okay, give me a notice in the chat if you guys can actually hear me. Oh, great, that's not working. Very good. My dog is uh, playing with a squeaker toy. Please enjoy the background yelps as we go. So we've got these various people operating in their own spheres. And one quick, uh, one quick thing to note is uh, if you've ever heard the term a quack, we usually refer to a doctor as a quack if they're a bad doctor, if they're ineffective. However, quack was literally the term given to someone who trespassed on another person's domain. So a surgeon who sold medicines would be called, called a quack because this person shouldn't be preparing medicines. A bone setter who helped someone give birth was a quack for poaching on the clientele of the midwife. So that's actually where that term comes from. So these people were all working in their own spheres, but they all agreed on the same essential idea of health and disease, which was the Hippocratic idea that the four humors were out of balance and that health would be brought about by bringing them back into harmony, largely by bleeding, purgatives, things like that. So we've already talked about how Galen, Hippocrates, and the four humors lasted for about 1,300 years of medical stasis this massive medical mistake that people assumed was correct just because of the authority of those original sources. However, what if I told you that humoral theory is not in fact the longest lived mistake in the history of medicine? It's not. Another bucket diagnosis that was just levied against women, you know, for many, many, many years between 4,000 to 2,500, depending on the sources you look at, was hysteria. And hysteria is nothing, yet it was treated as a definitive diagnosis for many times. Now, in ancient Greece, the uterus, the hysterix, was actually thought to detach from women and roam throughout their body, and that's what disrupted their humors, causing them to, and I'm using air quotes here, go crazy during menopause and was used to explain their inconvenient 
and sometimes uh, unruly behavior, according to the males at the time. So even after the uterus was known to be a stationary organ, this belief that the uterus was the source of feminine hysteria lasted for a very long time. And it was believed to be due to anything people could come up with. It was believed to be because of abstinence or too much sex or too much thinking about sex. Or as uh, one YouTuber actually put it, which I love this quote, hysteria was basically being a woman disease. It was a problem that, uh, or rather it was a diagnosis that would be applied to any woman who was being a problem for the male physicians or the male relatives in her life. And it was considered to be a neurotic disorder and psychoanalysis was used to treat it. And finally, when the DSM-3 came out, it was recognized to be garbage and was excluded as a medical diagnosis. And real quick, in the chat, somebody give me an idea about what year we think the DSM-3 came out and hysteria was finally not treated as an actual diagnosis. When we think of hysteria these days, we think of it as being someone who's kind of like, ah, crazed, a little out of control. Way too recent, you are not wrong. 1965, good, good. 1960, 60, oh wow. So Lucas and Hannah had the exact same idea there. Not bad, not long ago. All right, well, guess what? It was 1980, so yeah. I was seven years old uh, when hysteria was still a thing. So very recent that hysteria was relegated away from being an actual diagnosis because it really wasn't a thing. So the reason that hysteria persisted for so long a time, because it was an excellent justification for dismissing women's capabilities, women's concerns, and their capacities. Yeah, 1980 is exactly right. So essentially, it was a way that people could use to conveniently exclude women from not only medical education, but contributing to society in general. So what's interesting is that even apart from hysteria, other justifications were used to keep women out of medicine. In the 17th century, when humoral theory still held sway, it was believed that women's brains were too cold and soft for that strenuous thinking that had to take place in medicine. And even after humoral theory went away, in the 18th century, it was believed that women's skulls were just too small for such thoughts to occur. So we used phrenology, the palpation of bumps on the skull, to justify the exclusion of women. And moving forward into the 19th century, it was thought that too much exercise on the brain would actually make women's ovaries shrivel away to nothing. So we were trying to come up with some quote unquote physiological justification for excluding women. And quite honestly, in the chat, let me know, have you guys heard of any particularly ridiculous kind of uh, recent justifications for why women and medicine don't mix something that involves genetics or proteins? Because this thing rears its head all the time. Whenever there's scientific advances, it's not unusual for people to try to find a way to explain using it how they think women should be excluded from medicine, science, or other aspects of, um, of society in that way. So if anyone comes up with something good like that, let me know. I'd like to add to this slide whenever you come across any news story about why women are, quote unquote, not as capable of working as men. Can't balance. Oh, let's see. We got in the chat. Can't balance family and work. Having kids will take away from the practice. Yeah, absolutely. The idea that uh, the fact that women tend to be the caregivers for their children as well as for their older parents is often used as a way to, mm, shall I say, dismiss their contributions in the workplace. One stop. Oh, that low blood pressure meant you had to have an office job and couldn't be on your feet all day. That's interesting. Oh, that women care too much. That's a riot. And too emotional attached to the patient. Wow. Okay. So basically things that could be a real asset to you as a physician have been turned around as a uh, way to make you feel that you shouldn't be a physician. That's horrifying. And sorry that you've heard that. I've heard patients refuse to conduct studies that don't include that include women because of hormones. Interesting. Yeah, actually, uh, one fun fact when uh, I don't remember which drug it was, one of the big drugs that's prescribed very frequently now it might have been Prozac. I think it was actually. Oh, gosh, I don't remember which one. There was one of the big drugs that uh, was put out about 20 years ago that had no women in the group of sa the sample of people who were tried with this drug for experimentation to see what side effects existed. 
So yeah, exclusion of women as well as using women as a, or using women's hormonal differences from men as a justification for not letting them in. These things come up a lot. And it's actually really difficult to sometimes tell what things are a dodge to justify sexism and what things might be legitimate in terms of the actual hormonal differences between women and men. Now, one aspect of that you might want to keep in mind is that the generic woman and generic man don't really exist. There's just kind of gradations in terms of hormonal levels between people. All right. Great discussion, guys. It's almost like we're here in person. I like the chat. It would be better if you were here, but I like the chat. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Don't mention having kids on a resume. resume. They don't want you to take off for sick days. Yeah, I actually know female faculty members who were told not to mention their families or children during interviews because it was felt that that would compromise their ability to get a job. They you know, found out that places like uh, WSOM actually value people who have family and outside activities, but many places see an outside life, children, family, etc. as a hindrance to your getting your job done. So remember that when you interview at a place, they're not just interviewing you, you're interviewing them. And it's better to take a less prestigious job at a place you can do good work with good people than a prestigious place that's going to grind you into dust. All right, great chat on the chat. Let's keep on rolling. So what are these roadblocks that are occurring in the you know, early modern era? Now, women were not necessarily barred from practicing medicine moving into the 18th century, but they were de facto barred because they weren't allowed to attend medical universities or medical schools. So even if they attained a medical degree, degree, they really didn't have much opportunity to practice unless they had male partners or husbands who were also involved in medicine. Uh, hospitals could just uh, deny a spot to anybody. And so they would just de deny women the opportunity to even have opportunity to practice in a hospital. And medical associations did not accept female doctors. Now, I don't try to go rah, 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 osteopathy for no good reason, but there are some excellent reasons to be proud of the field of osteopathy. And in this case, one of them is that when the first school of osteopathy opened, women were allowed to matriculate on the same basis as male students. And this was a year before Johns Hopkins opened to much acclaim allowing women to matriculate. Now, Harvard and Yale, the big names, were unavailable to women until well after the 1940s. So the big names often also tend to be the places that are the most static and sometimes places that are a little more scrappy are a little more willing to do innovative things that challenge existing ideas. So let's talk about a few people of the early modern contemporary era. So one of the big names in women's history and medicine is Elizabeth Blackwell. And she graduated from the Geneva Medical School in New York in, in 1849, pardon me, and actually founded her own infirmary for indigent women. She helped organize women uh, nurses for the Civil War and dealing with the casualties that came in and actually opened a women's medical college. Now, this was before the Flexner Report, so I really doubt that this college was able to make it through, but it was at a high standard, you know, probably a higher standard than the other medical colleges up until the founding of Johns Hopkins. Admissions required an exam, there was a curriculum with a great deal of clinical opportunity and medical examiners to maintain the quality of the people who practiced. Now, jumping back to England, we have Elizabeth Garrett, who was the first woman doctor there in the UK. She graduated from a medical school in Paris, not being allowed to practice and train in England, but then established a dispensary for women in England. She established the London School of Medicine for Women. That was in 1874, so we're getting a little bit closer to the same events occurring in the United States, and had relatively high standards for the time as well. Remember, medicine was not always a high status career. In fact, I'd say uh, not only was it not high status, there were often very few standards applied to the people who practiced it. Now, I would make the case that we're probably overregulated these days and that we actually need to back off a little on the uh, just unreasonable amount of testing, board examination, etc. But they do serve a purpose in theory, which is to maintain the quality of the people in the practice. It's just you can go overboard on anything. Now, you've probably heard of Maria Montessori. And she got a medical degree from Italy in, in 1896 at the University of Rome. 
Now, you've probably heard of her in conjunction with Montessori schools, and she actually came into the field of education through medicine. She worked with people who had uh, developmental delays or mental problems and realized that these people were actually quite capable if they were educated and encouraged to explore through creative play rather than being held to the same instructional standards as people who did not have these delays and that they could actually live an independent and relatively well, you know, kind of an independent and kind of happy lifestyle if they were worked with and encouraged to play. And she developed the same sort of educational approach with children, which is why we know her mostly these days from the Montessori schools that use creative play as the springboard for education. Now, Maud Abbott has actually been brought up once before, but just to reiterate, she was a Canadian, graduated from McGill in Montreal, and was denied entry to medical school being a woman. So she went to, in, uh, to Europe, rather, attended medical school in Zurich, and then Vienna. And when she came back to McGill, she started investigating heart malformations and became the basic um, encyclopedia of cardiac disease publishing an atlas of congenital cardiac diseases in 1936. Now, she was consulted by a woman we've already discussed, Helen Tausig. Helen Tausig was involved in the first heart operation at Johns Hopkins, or, well, the first heart operation, which occurred at Johns Hopkins. And she graduated from Hopkins with a fellowship in cardiology, uh, took charge of the pediatric cardiac clinic, and with Dr. Uh, Dr. Alfred Blaylock and Vivian Thomas was able to do the first repair on the great vessels to correct a congenital heart malformation, Tetralogy of Fallot. Now, uh, Hopkins was considered to be fairly egalitarian with opportunities for women, but even after she was involved in this landmark activity, this massively impressive surgical feat she uh, published Congenital Malformations of the Heart, uh, became two volumes. It still took her about 20 more years to reach full professor. So even though Hopkins was relatively more enlightened, the opportunities for women were still not quite as rosy as they should have been. And Vivian, I'm very happy you watched uh, Something the Lord Made. I cried I cried many, uh, many a tear at the end of that movie when the, the portraits of uh, Vivian and uh, Dr. Bl uh, Vivian Thomas and Alfred Blaylock are shown side by side. Uh, one thing about Helen Tausig, in addition to what we talked about last time with the history of surgery, is that she was also instrumental in uh, preventing thalidomide from being marketed in the United States. Now, thalidomide is something we hear about occasionally here, but it's much more well known in Europe because it was used as an anti-nausea medicine. The problem is it causes tremendous defects in development of the limbs, and women would take it when they would have morning sickness, maybe even not knowing that they were pregnant at the time, but it would cause, and the time when women are most prone to having morning sickness while pregnant is the time when the limbs are forming. So thalidomide was almost tailor-made to be an agent that caused limb malformations. And having found out that this was happening in Europe, Helen Tausig and Francis Kelly campaigned to stop it from being marketed in the U.S., which is why we don't see people with focomelia, where the uh, limb bones are not present, but the hands are kind of coming off the shoulders as frequently in the United States. Uh, in fact, the linamide is available. It's an actually, it's a very potent anti-nausea medicine, but it's 100% absolutely contraindicated in women of childbearing age because it can cause these significant limb malformations. So let's jump back to osteopathy. And I, for many years, had a very pixelated uh, version of this picture here. I'm very happy to have a much better one now where you can see the first class of people in osteopathy. And first off, let's just take a moment to note that people in the 1800s were far snappier dressers than we are now. I think we've regressed significantly in terms of just our everyday uh, level of uh, level of appearance. Now, I'm not going to say that uh, personal hygiene maybe was always the greatest in that time, but I think we could do better when it comes to actual uh, dress. Anyhow, so A.T. Still allowed women to enter the school at the same basis as men, and in 1894, there were four women in the first graduating class, Nettie Boyles, Lou Kern, Mamie Hate Harder, and Blanche Still. So here's a picture of those graduates, and yeah, there are indeed four women in the picture. 
Now, the AMA. Oh, and thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, that's one reason I dress up for lectures. One, because I think it's funny, and two, just because I like to uh, like to step it up a little. Now, the AMA, the mainline uh, MD degree granting organization, didn't accept women as members until 1915. However, the AOA had female members as early as 1897. So early osteopathy had many women. In fact, 35% of the DOs were women in the early 1900s, which is absolutely phenomenal. And by the 1920s, 50% were women. So that's really good. Now, let's step back a little bit. Not everything was going to be completely egalitarian. It wasn't until 2009, a century on, that we actually had the first woman president of the AOA. So even though it was a role offered for women, leadership was still relatively difficult to break into. So amongst these people at the early stage of osteopathy, we have Nettie Bowles. She was basically, uh, well, she grew up with the osteopathic uh, field in the background. She was the first editor and publisher of the J Journal of Osteopathy, now the JAOA. She is the first women. Vi oh, she is the first vice president of the AOA, which is odd that it took over 100 years for the first woman president of the AOA to occur. And she was nominated for that role in 1917, but didn't quite get there. Louisa Burns was a female researcher who really dedicated her career to understanding how manipulation physiology and anatomy were connected. So she started in 1916 as the dean of the A.T. Still Research Institute and was there for 20 years, looking at how the spine and viscerosomatic reflexes were connected and how there was an anatomical and neurological basis for those tissue texture changes that we all spent a lot of time understanding in OPP and how the somatic body and the visceral body are connected through the spinal cord. Let's see. Uh, your hoodie is much more comfortable than a corset. Yeah, and I'm I'm not. I will. I'll publicly state I'm not trying to bring back the corset. That's not. Uh, that's not my agenda. Although if I did want to bring back the corset, it would have to be uh, for males and females, and I'm not going to go there. So yeah, corsets are out. I'm just saying. Uh, maybe the occasional ruffle and cravat could uh, could make a play for uh, inclusion. So let's take a quick look here at some of the more recent data of graduates from American medical schools. Now, whoop, jumping forward. So here in the dots, we have women graduates moving from 1980 up to 2018. And what's really interesting here is that we have a converging line between male and female graduates right here around 2008. And then there was a big push to open new medical schools and accept uh, more students per class. And we basically then have relatively parallel lines going. However, there still tend to be fewer female graduates from medical school, although obviously things have improved immensely in the last 40 years or so. Now, let's discuss how American medicine has involved served and failed African Americans. So in jumping back to the same era in 1900, there were actually 10 schools in America that accepted black or African American students. This was in the pre-Flexner Report era. When the Flexner Report came out, it shut down many schools. And sadly, unsurprisingly, the uh, schools that accepted African American students were early in the process of being removed from the schools that were allowed to continue and receive Carnegie Foundation money to follow the Hopkins model. So by 1923, only Meharry and Howard were left as medical schools that accepted African American students. Now the Flexner Report amongst, you know, it's one of those mixed bag things. The Flexner Report did some good things in terms of standardizing and improving the quality of American medical education, but it also was very much serving the Hopkins model and the AMA and dismissively suggested that African-Americans who wished to study medicine should instead focus on public health rather than becoming physicians. Now, in the 40s, Southern medical schools began desegregating, and this was still at the time when the majority of African-Americans were 
located in the south before there was some migration northward into the industrial careers that were opening up in the Rust Belt cities of the U.S. And in consequence, when desegregation happened, attendance at medical schools became more common, but was still relatively difficult. There was, you know, even if officially schools accepted black students, they were not going to be at the same, You, the students had to really shine in comparison to their white peers who might be given an easier path in. So in response, there were two primarily African-American medical schools that opened up in Los Angeles. There was Charles Drew, and in Atlanta, we have Morehouse School of Medicine. I actually know some faculty there. They're awesome. I hope to visit someday, and that's a picture of Morehouse right here. So let's talk about some of the names that we have to associate with the people involved in making this change. Now, James McCune Smith, this this man, there needs to be a documentary about this guy's life, or at least uh, something, some some sort of a uh, record, because at age 25, he left, you know, he left before 25 to attend medical school in Scotland, graduating at the top of his class because he wasn't able to study medicine in the United States. And he moved back to Manhattan and not only became the first African-American physician there, but ran a pharmacy as well. Now, that's great. But in addition to all that, he was a teacher, he wrote voluminously, and he was a well-known abolitionist who worked closely with Frederick Douglass to end slavery in the pre-Civil War era. He organized or was involved in organizing the Underground Railroad and worked against the Fugitive Slave Act in New York that would return escaped slaves back to the South. And not surprisingly, being a black physician, he was excluded from the AMA and other local medical societies. Now, the truly amazing thing is despite this unbelievably distinguished biography, his contributions and knowledge of his contributions were lost and only relatively rediscovered because his uh, descendants were actually less inclined to mention that they were uh, related to him because they were trying to distance themselves uh, from their African-American relative. I believe there was... Uh, they had married into some uh, some white families and had, at the time, seen this connection to him as shameful due to his race, rather than something to be incredibly proud of because of his achievements. And that just floors me that that was even a choice people were willing to make. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, this is an amazing story because she was the first African-American woman to earn a medical degree and went to the New England Female Medical College in 1864 and really worked hard to improve the communities that she lived in. And when the Civil War ended, this just blows my mind, she relocated to post-war antebellum Richmond, Virginia to treat the newly freed slaves, the black citizens in the South. And you can, I can't, I don't think you can, nor can I, imagine the oppressive racism and hostility that she would have had to encounter, not only as an outsider coming in, but an outsider coming in to treat the newly freed black citizens in Virginia, which had been the capital of the Confederacy. So upon returning to Boston, she continued to practice and worked writing a book on medical discourses focusing on both, focusing on both women and children's health. So Daniel Hale Williams is not as uh, famous a name, but I think you'll find his story particularly interesting because he actually could lay a claim to being the first person to conduct thoracic surgery. So he was the son of a barber, so had a medical background, in attended Chicago Medical College in 1883 is when he graduated, and he founded a hospital in Chicago. It was uh, not only open to black patients was actually owned by black um, citizens and physicians who practiced there. So in 1893, a patient arrived with a chest wound. I believe he'd actually been uh, stuck with a knife or an ice pick in the chest. Oh yeah, and then I agree with you, the beard is on point. I wish I could get anywhere close to that level of, uh, that level of density there. But um, the gentleman had actually had um, a nick into his heart through the pericardium, but it wasn't a big wound, but he was getting to have uh, cardiac tamponade due to fluid building up in the pericardium. So at the time, it was felt that entering the thorax for any reason was a death sentence to the patient. However, 
uh, Daniel Williams went through the intercostal space, sutured the pericardium, used antisepsis, the Listerian techniques were indeed known at that time, and was able to fix this person up who then left. And this was really the first document in thoracic surgery, although a physician in St. Louis was known to operation, but an account of it wasn't known until later. So he then taught clinical surgery at Meharry Medical College thereafter and co-founded the National Medical Association, a competitor of the AMA that did allow African-American physicians and surgeons to join. Now, jumping back to our last talk on the history of surgery, it's hard to kind of look beyond Vivian Thomas as the epitome of how research and surgery can be combined to make massive medical innovations. Working with Alfred Blaylock, Vivian Thomas did all the legwork of figuring out how to perform surgeries that would then go on to help resolve surgical shock, uh, wartime shock in people in World War II, as well as the correction of Tetralogy of Fallot using the Blaylock Tossig shunt. So he wanted to attend medical school, but his uh, savings were wiped out during a bank failure and moved on to Vanderbilt as a custodian and then became uh, the uh, technician for Alfred Blaylock. Now, this is one of those places where it's a mixed bag again, because Vivian Thomas should have had all the opportunities to become a surgeon physician of his own right that, that were available, but because of the times and the restrictions, that didn't happen. But Alfred Blaylock was able to give him a route to contribute to the medical um, profession and medical history. So that's praiseworthy, but it would be even more praiseworthy had he been supported in his uh, process of becoming an equal to the surgeons and physicians that he worked with and trained throughout his career. And so, as I mentioned last time, he actually was the person who oversaw the first heart operation doing the Blaylock toxic shunt because Dr. Blaylock had not in fact done this procedure, you know, more than once. And it was, had been on a dog and had not actually been successful. So Vivian Thomas was actually the person in charge of directing the chair of surgery at Johns Hopkins in how to do this. And essentially Eileen Saxon, the 11 month old girl who received this procedure lived for several more years. Now she did die uh, closer to her third birthday, but the lessons they learned as they proceeded saved many more patients. And in fact, many of them lived beyond 15 years and underwent actual heart corrective surgery once the lung heart bypass machine had been invented. Now, another um, aspect of how African-Americans have been affected by medicine is their use as and ex, you know, legitimate exploitation as experimental subjects. The Tuskegee syphilis study is probably the most well-known and potentially one of the more horrific instances where African-American patients with syphilis were tracked to see how the disease would occur and would develop over time. And when the study began, that tracking made sense because no one knew how syphilis really progressed and we had a large population of people to track it in. However, antibiotic interventions for syphilis became available and yet these patients were not allowed or not offered the antibiotics that would actually cure the disease because the researchers wanted to continue tracking how syphilis would manifest as it moved from primary to secondary to tertiary stages causing neurologic deficits and death. And the um, book that's listed here in medical apartheid i you know sad to say i've not actually read it yet it's sitting you know literally three feet away from me it's one of the next books on my list to read through but the justifications for using african americans and um, you know black patients uh, people of african descent throughout um, western medical history is voluminous and shameful because Justifications have just been laid out willy nilly. Oh, you know, people from Africa don't feel pain as intensely as Europeans. So it's okay to do these terrible things to them. It's just a horrific history that needs to not only be addressed, but brought into the limelight so people know not to let that happen again. Now, one of the more recent 
um, descriptions of something that's interesting in this regard involves the uh, story of a woman named Henrietta Lacks. Now, Henrietta Lacks uh, was a woman in actually from the Roanoke, Virginia area who had a cervical tumor removed in 1951. And she really was not told what was going on. And this was relatively common for a lot of patients at the time being treated for cancer. They were not really included in their treatment plan. The physicians just did what they thought was best without letting the patients know. Now that's not good, but it wasn't out of the ordinary. What was out of the ordinary, her cervical uh, biopsy cells were found to divide continually in solution. And these cells, these immortal cells, are called the HeLa cell line, Henrietta Lacks HeLa, were then able to be used for cell culture. And this is what made cell culture actually possible and allowed people to have human cells divide repeatedly in the culture media. And this led to amazing medical breakthroughs like the polio vaccine. Pretty much any type of cell culture is only possible because of the Henrietta Lacks donated, or I say donated, I should say uh, biopsied cells. Now she died of the tumor shortly after the cells were removed and she had no idea that they had been harvested for research purposes. Her family was never informed about this, although they were brought into Johns Hopkins for additional testing and tissue sampling to see if their cells and any biopsies of theirs would have the similar properties. So they were deliberately kept in the dark regarding how these cells were used. Now, had these cells only been used for scientific experimentation and research, you could make the case that that is a zero sum game. It's okay. But many people started getting very rich off the culture distribution and commercial exploitation of these cells, which was of no benefit to Henry Delax or to her family thereafter. And so this, um, and by the way, this book is fantastic. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It really underscores how medicine has changed in the last 50, last 50 years to bring up ideas of consent and actually having patients be aware of what's going to be done with, to them, what's going to be done with their cells, as well as privacy. These cells and all the genetic information from within them have been used commercially you know, for years upon years, and yet the family was not really a concern for the people doing this exploitation. And how ownership of tissues and donors is still being hotly debated and whether we own our own tissues once they've left our body. All right, so we have reached the end of our series. And I just wanna jump back and give you guys a few parting thoughts on this. And one of the amazing things that's becoming more apparent all the time is that many of the people who made these monumental discoveries as history proceeds and we get a better understanding of how things developed in different cultures, we find out that these discoveries were not necessarily attributed to the very first people who discovered them. So on um, Kos, where Hippocrates was coming up with the humoral theory of disease, there was another nearby island with another set of physicians who organized and categorized illness according to the affected regions and organs. Now, this was actually more in line with how we practice medicine today. So why didn't that take off? Why didn't that bear fruit? Well, it was largely because the interventions that were available didn't make it any more practical. Even though Hippocrates' system of medicine was based on faulty structural bases, the ethical and practice-based observations that he encouraged actually did more good than these other competing physicians who had a theory that turns out to be more accurate scientifically, but didn't have the same level of professionalism. Uh, there are actually coming to be more and more um, findings about Chinese and Arabic medical records that show circulation of the blood and other things like that before William Harvey described it and put, entered it into the tradition where we actually were able to use it. And there's actually a really interestingly recently been some Chinese text discovered from, you know, the first century of the common era. So first century AD that can be interpreted as a dissection based anatomy atlas for acupuncture. Now, this does not mean that the people who wrote this understood the circulation of the blood, but they did notice that nerves, arteries, and veins tended to run together and did come up with atlases to 
understand human anatomy based on the medical paradigm in which they were operating. Now, that might seem a little bit far-fetched, but remember the anatomy atlases that were being promoted early on in the Renaissance era had nothing to do with the anatomy we understand. They were very diagrammatic and very much in line with understanding the humoral theories. So the fact that these Chinese um, anatomy atlases don't revolve around our understanding of modern anatomy doesn't disqualify their importance. In fact, uh, Hua To, a Chinese physician from the first century, is reputed to use anesthesia to perform different surgical procedures. Now, it's a shame that that um, usage didn't catch on and stick around. I think uh, no one would argue that two millennia of painful surgery is too many. So these discoveries existed, but it's also worth debating why are discoveries sometimes accepted and sometimes lost? And this one just floors me. Decades, decades before uh, Ignaz Semmelweis figured out that hand washing was connected with better outcomes with the um, maternity patients at the obstetrics unit in Vienna, and Joseph Lister figured out that um, you could create antiseptic surgery, there were British physicians, a guy named Alexander Gordon and Charles White, who thought that doctors' hand contact might be spreading the childbed disease. And this one is, this takes a moment to explain, but there was an American physician and anatomist. He was the anatomy professor at Harvard, a guy named Oliver Wendell Holmes, who actually nailed it. He figured out that hand washing could cure the uh, could stop this massive infection that occurred when patients were examining women. Now, this you you could say, okay, well maybe he didn't have much of a podium to present this from. This guy, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, first off was going to he was the father of a uh, Supreme Court justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. But he also was known as the autocrat of the breakfast table. He had a newspaper column that was read by nearly everyone in the country for years. He had this monstrously huge podium from which to tell people about this discovery, this thing that could have saved lives. And yet he didn't. He was a well-known intellectual. And yet he wasn't able to promote his own theory, which turned out to be correct, about how to stop the spread of infection. It just blows my mind. So all in all, what makes the difference between a discovery that takes and a discovery that is lost? It's hard to pin down any one cause, but I'd like you to take a moment to compare Ignaz Semmelweis in Vienna, who tried to institute the hand washing with Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was an excellent communicator, had a real flair for drama. Now, it's not that everything he did was wonderful, but he was incredibly good at promoting his message. Ignaz Semmelweis, equally insightful, but a terrible communicator, did not manage to work with the people he was with in a way that allowed him to get his message out. So sometimes it's not enough to be right. You have to say things and, and do things consistently enough and with enough persistence that people listen to you. And... The last thing I want to mention is this great quote from A Short History of Medicine by uh, Akronek. It's that great ideas and great inventions do not necessarily win acceptance because of their inherent value. You have to fight for those good discoveries. You have to push for people to adopt that because stasis is hard to disrupt. And yet, if you're going to make contributions to a field, you have to be willing and able to push people till they accept these great innovations. And... I hope that is an inspirational place to leave you guys for the time being. Any questions or other aspects anybody wants to bring up? Got to give me something. I don't think we can have beard goals as the, uh, the very last thing on the chat. Excellent. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> Not that beard goals is bad, but uh, I think we want to leave, end with something a little more apropos. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your uh, contributions. You're, you're just uh, sticking around with it, and I appreci especially appreciate your interest in this topic. I think it's fascinating, and uh, I just want to try to convey my fascination with it to you all, so hopefully you guys take it 
and use that medical history as a way to situate your own self in your own career, understand your role in history, and hopefully gives you some inspiration in difficult times. Yeah, the dog bone chewing in the background is very relaxing. Sorry about that. It's uh, one of the joys of working from home. <laughs> we didn't have barking. I was more worried about barking. All right, you guys are all wonderful, and I will catch you soon. Have an excellent rest of the semester. Keep pushing hard, and I will be in contact. Cheers.